Welcome to today's podcast. Our topic is magical museums, and in particular, a collection that we in Norwich have been putting together over the last 20 years. And we call it the Ikeni Collection, East Anglian Museum of Magic and Mythology. Now, of course, when people think about magical museums, they immediately think about the wonderful Witchcraft Museum in Boss Castle. And, of course, that is a fabulous collection of magical items of all kinds. And when you go there, you can really get inspiration of all magical types. You can get ideas for spells, for things to make. And you can really feel a deep connection to the magic of the ancestors. And I think we all have particular favourites there. My favourite part has to be old Joan sitting at her table in her cottage, speaking her spells with all her animals around her at her wonderful kitchen table there. It's so atmospheric and and, and so evocative. And the poppets, too, are absolutely wonderful. Though, of course, they are not all made with benign purposes. In fact, I don't think any of them are really made for for pleasant purposes at all. But they really do evoke that power of the witch to affect people's lives, albeit in this case in not very pleasant ways. I remember on one occasion being there and Graham King telling me about the measures that have to be taken in order to keep those poppets under control. I love the spirit houses there too. There's one in particular which is in a largish glass bottle and it's a real complex maze of little cotton reels covered in brightly coloured threads which confuse any malign spirits and, and keep them occupied for a very long time. Well, my first visit to the Witchcraft Museum in Boss Castle was a really long time ago, probably, I think, in the 1960s, because I definitely was taken there as a child by my parents. Remembering this has always surprised me, actually, because my parents were, and my mother still is, very strictly Christian. The idea of taking me to that place is quite surprising, really, because they would then, and and my mother would now, find the whole idea of witchcraft as completely abhorrent. But they must have thought that it had an interesting educational purpose for me. Well, in fact, it did. Obviously, not at all the kind that they were thinking of, because it did have a profound effect on me. But what I remember most is the kind of overall impression of the museum rather than any specific items at the time. Though I do remember in particular an exhibit that isn't actually there anymore and that's of a woman lying on an altar with two massive candlesticks on either side of her and symbols above her on the wall. I suppose on that occasion it's just possible that I did actually meet Cecil Williamson or at least see him perhaps in passing, but I have actually no memory of that at all. And in fact, I didn't return to the Witchcraft Museum in Boss Castle until Imbolg of 1999. And I actually went there on a bit of a flying visit with Matthew Hannam, who had just recently set up the Minor Arc Corner Pagan Teenage Network, which had proved really successful and published a magazine and got together a really vibrant group of people who went on to do great things in the magical world and indeed in their mundane lives as well. And of course, at that time, because it was out of season, the museum wasn't open. But Graham, who hadn't, I think, very long been the proprietor at that point, agreed to see us and to let us go into the museum. 
And of course, we were absolutely entranced by the experience and came away full of enthusiasm and inspiration. And I suppose it was this visit, really, that led to our dream of having an East Anglian museum. We didn't wish to step on the toes of the Boss Castle Museum or anybody else for that matter. But Boss Castle is 400 miles away from Norwich. So anybody from here who wants to go there has really to make a major pilgrimage. And not everybody can afford to do that in terms of time or indeed of the money involved in such a journey. So we felt that there really was a need for a resource for people locally so that they could see and study a range of magical items, not just the things that they used. So we set up a ritual not long after we came back and the purpose of the ritual was to attract magical items for our own museum. And I can remember that night in the garden. It was very dark and very cold. And there were about seven of us there in the ritual. It progressed in our usual format, but the main part of it, the magical part, was a visualisation which came across with real intensity and clarity in which we saw magical items coming towards us to the centre of our circle and being part of the work that we were doing. I've done a lot of rituals in my time and many of them you forget, but that one really does stick in my mind, even though the working out of its purpose has taken a very long time. But it wasn't at all long after that ritual that I was in an antique shop in King's Lynn and I saw a fabulous green Victorian witch ball hanging up. Now, it was quite expensive and I didn't at the time have enough money to buy it. So I wove a little cloaking spell over it so that nobody else would notice it before I was able to come back with the money. And sure enough, it didn't take me very long to get enough money together. And when I returned for it, it was still there. And for me, that is one of the prize items of the collection, because an old glass witch ball, especially a green one, was something that I really, really did want to have for the museum. And it wasn't very long after that that I found a lovely dark green glass twizzle stick or a glass cane, one of those items which is used to hang up in order to absorb any illness and protect the household from it. You need to wipe them on a regular basis with a soft cloth and then, of course, dispose of the cloth. And you must be very, very careful not to break them. But again, this one that I have is Victorian and... And the seller told me that it was most likely made in Nailsea, the famous glassworks in Bristol. Now, the other item that I particularly remember getting in those early days was quite a small crystal ball on a stand. And the stand had obviously been hand carved with a great deal of love and magical attention, but not an enormous amount of carving skill. But it's an absolutely lovely thing. Many times, in fact, I've tried to have a go at scrying in it. But all I ever tend to see is the previous owner, who looks to me to have been a woman, a ceremonial magician, probably somebody quite wealthy with quite a large house where she lived and practised her magic. I haven't actually managed to discover whether she was local to this area or whether the crystal ball had come from elsewhere. But who knows, maybe eventually she will tell me. Over the years, many more objects have come to us, but most of us who were involved in that initial ritual were given other magical tasks to do. I myself uh, studied herbal medicine. Matthew went abroad and he's lived in all sorts of different countries ever since then. It really fell to my husband Chris to take on the major magical task of learning the skills that you need to run a museum, look after the objects and 
display them so that you, you can put across your story to people in the best possible way. So I thought what I'd do today is ask him some questions about the museum. So, Chris, one of the things that I've always been curious about is why it was that out of all those people back there in the 90s, it was you who was chosen to focus so much on this magical collection and on preparing for this really vast museum project. Why was it you? What, what do you <laughs> think? Well, there could be lots of reasons, but I've always loved objects. I like to see the associations and research, find out what they mean, what they link to. I've always been one for crossing disciplinary boundaries, whether that's academically or in any other sphere. I don't usually follow the obvious prescribed route. I mean, with history, I will tend to focus on a particular period and expand out from there, or a particular object or a particular person. So I think I'm quite well suited to the sort of curatorial research that's needed. You take an object and then you work out from what story you know how it fits into everything else. Or you know the story and you look out for objects that help you tell that story. I set about learning how to look after the objects and how to tell those stories in a museum-style way. Too late really for me to go back to basics and do a degree in museum studies. So I started volunteering at Norwich Castle Museum in the Decorative Arts Department and later on I did some front of house work at Great Yarmouth Museums and also got involved on a voluntary basis with Conservation Deep Cleans at a historic house in Norwich. Now there are lots of courses around the country that will train you in various aspects of museums work. Quite early on I went on one organised by University College London in association with English Heritage to do with conservation cleaning which is vitally important if you want to keep your items whole or if you want to keep them for a long period of time you'll make sure that pests, damp and various other problems don't degrade them. But once I started volunteering, I found I had access to another source of courses run by Share Museums East. And I've been on a very great number of the courses they've run. And that, they've ranged from introductory basic museum courses, courses looking at the organisation, the paperwork, if you like, how you record objects, how you identify them in terms of putting them on the database, knowing which one's which, photography, conservation, display, knowing how to look after particular things and how to uh, store them well, particularly for complex and large floppy items, say, uh, handling them is quite a skill in itself, so you don't actually damage them. Now, I've probably chosen courses that were ones particularly useful to this project, which involves objects that don't fit into the normal museum categories. Go to a, a large museum and you'll probably find there's a decorative arts department, there's an art department, an archaeology, social history, natural history. Things get put into boxes and lots of magical items actually move between those boundaries. And it's very useful to be able to see how a geologist would look after an object, which in our case might also be in what someone else would call a social history collection or a decorative arts collection and how different people will see it. That helps me to understand how we might want to display it, store it, etc. from our particular magical perspective. So I think I'm now in the position where I can apply all of those pieces of skill, pieces of experience, as we move forward into a new future for the Akini Collection. I know not um, all of the items in the collection are from East Anglia, you know, and of course, you know, people don't necessarily agree about what kind of items perhaps should be in the collection. <laughs> so perhaps you could explain a bit about, you know, your thinking of, of what objects we should have and where they should come from. Any museum, any collection has to have boundaries. Uh, otherwise, you collect everything and anything and well, you wouldn't have anywhere to store them. And that in itself is an issue because if you can't store it properly, then really you shouldn't have it because someone else could maintain it better. For the Ikini collection, we're looking at magic and mythology. Now, those are quite broad categories. 
uh, to take the mythology angle, you've got the obvious mythology. But a statue or an image of a deity could be purely decorative to one person. Another person could take that same object and actually put it on their altar. So where do you draw the line? And in terms of geography, we try to have some link to East Anglia or the neighbouring areas, whether that's being made here, used here, or having some other association with someone in East Anglia. We've got some pudding charms that belong to someone who's settled here in Norwich, but came from Yorkshire, and those pudding charms would have been actually used in Yorkshire. And then there's the question of where they're actually made. It may not even have been in this country. We are sufficiently globalised, and have been a long time, for, for a particular artefact to have been made on the other side of the world, and yet be relevant to us here and now. Also, if we're telling the stories of myth and of magic, we sometimes need to show things with a bit of distance, whether that's in order to show comparisons, similarities elsewhere, but also just to be able to tell the story. And we're becoming, I think, in a little while to an object that raises questions about how myths and response to deity vary or are similar around the world. But whilst we try to have a local link, I think it's perfectly valid to have things that don't have a connection if they help tell the story. That's really interesting. So tell us a little bit about how the objects are chosen. So can you tell us something about the places that you've found suitable items for the collection? Some of the objects have been donated by people who made them or used them, but a lot of them have indeed been found by myself or other people involved. A good source, of course, are flea markets and antique shops, but one shouldn't be sniffy about your common or garden charity shop. Things turn up in charity shops, you'd be surprised. And just a few weeks ago, in fact, I wandered into my favourite Oxfam shop, thinking, I think, of trying to fill the gaps in our collection of detective fiction novels. As soon as I walked in the door, there on the shelf in front of me was an amulet, a carved wooden amulet from the province of Swat in Pakistan that would have hung around the neck of a buffalo or perhaps some other livestock. There it was, sitting on the shelf. An obvious purchase uh, to add to the collection. I believe you've already got an amulet like that in the collection. Absolutely. And I suspect the provenance, as they say in the jargon, of the two overlapped because in Norwich we have something called the South Asia Collection, also known as the South Asia Decorative Arts and Crafts Collection. It began in 1979 when its proprietors were in South Asia, uh, including Swat Province, collecting items to show South Asian arts and crafts in the skill and beauty and uh, creativity, as well as the mythic symbolic religious associations and the mundane associations with them. It's an unusual collection because it's one that crosses the boundaries between a museum and a shop called Country and Eastern and the proprietors also work with craftspeople in South Asia to sell in the shop. They very much support indigenous crafts. The crafts of the people that aren't the obvious low caste crafts and so on. But they sold various things they had enough of for the collection and the buffalo amulet we've already got I know came from that source. I suspect the one I found in Oxfam did as well. The thing about these amulets that's so nice, they're carved out of wood and some of them have intricate designs carved which were used to identify the livestock owner to a certain extent. But the key thing is that they all have a hole in and in that hole would be some sacred object. This is Pakistan, so it was verses from the Quran or dust from a holy place put in there and then sealed up in order to be the protective thing and then hung around the animal's neck. Beautiful object and a little bit of magic from the Islamic world. I love the idea as well that you've got dust from a holy place in there because it chimes in with the idea that we have of picking up a pebble from a special place and keeping it with us. It's the same kind of magical thinking really, isn't it? Tell us about the time that you found a box of amazing magical items in Storks in the city centre. Well, in fact, just up the road from that same Oxfam shop, there's a, an interesting little antiques come upmarket junk shop uh, called Storks. And I was in there one day, I think this was back not long after we'd done the ritual, and I saw a crystal ball. And I looked at it and thought, it wasn't one of those sort of fake crystal balls you see being sold as pretty things in souvenir shops these days. This was obviously something that was used. And so I bought it and I inquired after its provenance and I was told that it had come from an old lady's house somewhere in East Anglia. It was from a house clearance. Next to this crystal ball, there was a box. 
box, a cigar box, and it had all sorts of odds and ends in it. And I asked the chap if by any chance it had come from the same place, and he said, yes, it had. You have it if you want. So, of course, I did not refuse. Because that box, you'd look at it and you think, well, that's just a box that someone's chucked odds and ends in. A brooch pin, a bit of silver chain, shard of cloth, curtain ring, copper nail, panel pin, a military dog tag, a leather arm badge that was probably military, a clay tobacco pipe bowl, a slip of paper with a strange mark on, a few bits of rubber band, pencil eraser, some used hagstones or holy stones. Now, we all put things in boxes of drawers and think, oh, that might be useful, and forget about it, and the elastic bands disintegrate and so on. But this box had come from the same place as that crystal ball, which clearly had been used. So I thought, there's more to this. And the kind of things, it wasn't just pins and nails. There was this piece of paper with a strange mark, these military bits and bobs. There's a piece of sealing wax and pieces of writing chalk. And this looks to me like someone's magical box of bits and each individual one take it or leave it but together it really felt interesting now to be honest it needs someone better at psychometry than me to really understand it i think but it's a really interesting thing and it's clearly something that someone had a feeling for that they were going to use these things or could use these things Yes, because we all collect items that have the potential for magic, don't we? That we tend to store in odd tins and boxes all over the place and we don't necessarily use them immediately. You know, that is a really interesting little box of treasures, isn't it? Now, obviously, you've had the website for quite some years now, and I was just wondering whether those items from Storks are <laughs> actually on the website. They're not. They're not. There's a lot in the collection that's not on the website. It's this year, really, it's, the website has begun to have more on it. Two reasons for that. One, because it is about talent, but also what with lockdown, there's a need to get things out there. The plan had been to get objects out, those that could tolerate it, as temporary displays in association with talks and so on, particularly for Norwich Pagan Moot, but elsewhere as well. Lockdown has rather put a stop to those sort of physical meetings. And whilst we've had some fantastic get-togethers on Zoom and Facebook watch party and so on, it's not the same. It's difficult to show things. So that was a, an incentive to get the website expanded a bit and indeed to start getting things out on social media as well. It tends to be things that are in themselves eye-catching, I think, because a picture tells a thousand stories. A picture is also something that uh, grabs your attention to actually listen to the story. So how do you choose which items you're going to put on social media? It needs to grab your attention. But also I try to vary it. There are all sorts of things in the collection, from that magical practitioner's box of oddments, through to you know, absolutely definite magical tools, charms, divination tools, things that show mythological scenes, all sorts of stuff. Some of it, particularly on the archival side, doesn't tell you a lot on its own. So you might have a ritual running order, for instance, but it needs a lot more around it. It doesn't work so well on Instagram. But also, it's not all the same. There are some charms up there, spells, bits of decorative art, or numismatics, that's coins, that show mythological scenes or mythological themes. And I'll try to vary those, as well as some things that are, if you like, folk magic. One of the things up there is a chunk of concrete from the Berlin Wall, which was actually given to me by an American chap who I knew on a Swedish language course in Sweden. Ooh, 30 years ago! <laughs> Because he had visited Berlin as the Berlin Wall was being dismantled. And like most visitors to Berlin, and indeed most, probably most residents of Berlin at the time, gathered up a few pieces of the wall as souvenirs and brought them back and gave them to friends and acquaintances. Pieces of the Berlin Wall were spread around the world as souvenirs. There does seem to be a human desire to have a souvenir or something, even if it's something bad. But equally, those chunks of the Berlin Wall were talismans of hope. Still are talismans of hope. So tell us about the plate with King Edmund and the wolf that you posted recently. Ah, yes. In the collection there are two saucers, probably from the 50s or early 60s, probably sold as souvenirs of Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. The design includes a wolf guarding the head of King Edmund, later Saint Edmund, patron saint of East Anglia, sort of patron saint of England before George, and of course the last Anglo-Saxon king of East Anglia. Now, the wolf comes into it because, according to the legend, when the Danes had invaded and captured Edmund and tried to get him to, to swear allegiance to them, 
Now that he wouldn't do, and he was, it seems, tortured to death, allegedly by being shot through with arrows, which incidentally, rather like St Sebastian, made him a defender against pestilence, useful figure to invoke at the moment. And when he was dead, they cut his head off, and they took his head to a place distant from where his body was, so that he wouldn't get a proper burial, and couldn't be an object of proper devotion. Someone saw where they took the head, or at least the woodland they took it into. And they heard a voice calling out, Here! Here! And they came to the head, being guarded by this large wolf. The thing about the wolf is that it makes a great deal of difference to the king of East Anglia. Edmund was the last in the line, maybe not a true lineal descendant, but last in the line of the Waffings. King Redwald, probably buried in the famous ship burial at Sutton Hoo, but perhaps the most famous Waffing king apart from Edmund, they were descended, so the genealogy goes, from Woden. They are the little wolves, the Wuffings. So the wolf is significant to the East Anglian kings, but it's significant in another way. And this is a way that crept onto early Anglo-Saxon coins, because it was a symbol of Rome. And the Anglo-Saxon kings looked up to Rome. They thought that the uh, Roman Empire was a glorious thing, and they sought to emulate it. And one of the ways they did that, they used a symbol of Rome, which was the wolf suckling Romulus and Remus. Now, without going to that full story, that's the foundation myth of Rome. Romulus and Remus, twins, were abandoned to the riverside, were washed up, and were suckled by a wolf who'd somehow lost her cubs. That symbol went on to become the symbol of Rome. And then when Christianity took over, it became the symbol of the Roman church. And, of course, the Anglo-Saxon kings, and Redwald onwards, accepted Christianity. Now, how much Redwald accepted it is open to question, certainly. But they wanted to show themselves to be Christian kings. They also wanted to show themselves as being somehow in the line of Rome. They were descended by Woden via Caesar. How that works out genetically is anyone's guess, but that's what was said. So Rome, Christianity through Rome, and their own symbol of the little wolves. That meant that the wolf was powerfully symbolic for Anglo-Saxon in East Anglia. But the wolf also appeared in a slightly different form as some very early Anglo-Saxon coins, particularly from Norfolk, and a form that seems to recall Iron Age coins of the Akane people, the wolf staters as they're called. And Daphne Nash Briggs has been quite eloquent in proposing that the British coins showing a wolf suggest a myth not that far away from the Germanic myth, we know it from the Norse as Fenrir, cosmic wolf that swallows the gods, swallows the sun and the moon. And Fenrir, the Fen wolf, she points to coins around the wash in Lincolnshire and Norfolk with wolves on, suggesting that maybe there was a cosmic Fen wolf for the Iron Age people of this part of the world. So that may be the wolf very important for Anglo-Saxon East Anglia, very important for the Romans. But maybe the wolf was very significant in East Anglia, even before, right back into the Iron Age, and before that maybe. You've talked about Iron Age coins, and of course one of my favourite items in the collection is the very tiny little coin, not with a wolf on, but with the Ikeni horse, because in fact we are fortunate enough to have a real Ikeni coin. You know, who knows, maybe the warrior queen Boudicca actually handled that coin herself at some point, which would indeed make it super magical. So I think that's always been one of my favourite items in the Ikeni collection. So what what is your favourite item? <laughs> well, that is one of mine as well, it has to be said. And it was, or a picture of it, was used as the logo of Norwich Pagan Moot for a number of years round about the turn of the millennium. So it has a more recent usage within the pagan community as well. It's difficult, that question, because there are lots of things that I like for all sorts of different reasons. There are some things I don't like, but they're important to have in the collection. But one of the things I do like is definitely not in origin from East Anglia, although it was bought here. And that is a rather odd-looking brass cup. It's odd because it has in the middle a flat figure of a man holding across his arms a child. Odder still, there's a funny little hole in the bottom. It's one of those times when you're at a flea market and you think, what on earth is that? How much is it? Hmm, okay. 
Yes, I need to find out what that is. So I spent years trying to find out. It looks Asian. I tried to research it. came up blank. Until one day I was in Oxford and I visited the Pitt Rivers Museum, which is a fantastic place. Old style museum display. Lots of things in lots of cabinets. But in those cabinets, there are two of these objects. Vasudeva Katora. Vasudeva is the father of Krishna. Katora is the kind of bowl or a kind of bowl. They're also called Krishna's siphon. And there's a clue because the story goes that Krishna was nearly killed by his wicked uncle who was the king. There had been a prophecy that one of the sons of Vashadeva would kill the king. So in the way that these stories go, the king set out to kill the offspring of Vasudeva and his wife. Vasudeva grabbed the child and set about carrying him across the river Yamuna to safety. The river Yamuna was in spate and Vasudeva bravely stepped into the water and miraculously the water didn't come above the child Krishna's foot. He took Krishna to safety, to a foster home, came back with a changeling baby that turned out later to be the goddess Durga in disguise and that was the end of the wicked uncles. Anyway, these brass cups are a special thing made in the place where that foster family was, in Mathura, the city of Mathura. And the idea is that if you put water in the cup, it will only fill up as far as the foot of the child Krishna and then it will run out by a clever siphon, which is why there's the hole in the bottom. On one level, it teaches children to be curious about things, how things work. It's also a way of conveying the myth, the story of the birth and the survival of Krishna. It's not magical in a sense, like a spell, but it is the magic of story and of mythology and the magic of curiosity. And actually, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you can see a lot of parallels between that story and the story of St. Christopher, who's very important to many people, you know, both from a point of view of Christian magic, but indeed pagan magic as well. Many people revere him and use his talismans for protection, particularly for journeys. Absolutely. We have in the collection a couple of St. Christopher pendants, which I say charms. One is clearly a pendant. Another, whilst it might have been made as a pendant, is a charm in a slightly different way because it is attached by a jump ring to a coin, pierced coin, pierced for this purpose. The coin is a 1965 ship halfpenny. So the question is, was someone born in 1965? Did they go on a journey that year, the ship, the journey? We don't know, but it's clearly put together for a purpose a protective purpose. St Christopher, of course, was a giant of a man who, according to the Christian legend, was given to evil until he saw that even Satan cringed at the sign of the cross, so he decided to serve Christ instead. And he, the way he was going to, he decided to do this was basically to offer a ferry service across a river, being a big chap. And one day, uh, a child turned up wanting to cross the river. So he carried the child on his shoulders, and as he went, the river got higher and higher, and the child got heavier and heavier. Finally, they reached the other shore, and St Christopher put the child down and said, wow, that was nearly impossible. And then the child reveals himself to be Christ, and says he did very well, because not only did you have uh, the creator but the entire world on your shoulders. Chris and Christopher became the saint that you could look to for protection. Portrayed on wall paintings in medieval churches opposite the main entrance. Idea being that if you saw and were seen by St Christopher you, according to belief, could avoid being dying in the next day or at least dying without the last rites in the next day. And that became extended to ver protection against various other mishaps. Not only wall paintings, but fantastic statues as well. There's one from Terrington St. Clement, which is now in Norwich Castle Museum. St. Christopher carrying the Christ child and all the fish swimming around his feet in the, all the waves. Beautiful piece of work. Yes, that is a fabulous statue, isn't it? And of course, a fabulous and enormous church out there in the fens in Terrington St. Clement. We do have some fantastic heritage in our churches and I think people involved in witchcraft, in magic, in paganism shouldn't be afraid to acknowledge that heritage because there's an awful lot of magic in it for a start and an awful lot of stuff that, shall we say, was inherited from elsewhere. Yeah, I think certainly the people of Terrington St Clement might want their St Christopher back <laughs> if global warming gets worse and the fens become wetter than they are at the moment. Not to have him there in the church, I think, is probably magically a bit problematic. We're coming to the end of this little session so let's just close by um, you telling people how you see the future of the Ikini Collection and our museum project. To look to the future, I think one needs to see where we are at the moment. And up to now, we've been making sure everything is as it should be. Setting the systems up, if you like. 
Now it's time to go a bit more public. I mentioned that we were planning to have objects out in, if you like, pop-up displays at talks and so on, which lockdown has rather stymied. So we need to get things out there more, hence one reason for expanding the website and starting promoting the collection on social media. That's a way, obviously, of getting more people to know about the collection. And in due course, we want to be able to show those people the collection in the flesh, so to speak. So are working with other people, particularly in Norwich Pagan Moot, towards the idea of some kind of premises where at least a portion of the collection can be shown. There is the project uh, under one roof that Norwich Pagan Moot has got going, along with the Akina Collection, to move that forward. And part of what will be displayed is another thing that has started up this summer, and that's the Living Norfolk Magic Project. Through the media of Instagram, people are being asked to contribute particular bits of magical craft, particular kinds of objects, which is an ongoing collection of magical artifacts, which is associated with the Akina Collection. Yeah, and we'll be talking more about Living Norfolk Magic next time. So thank you very much for listening and we'll see you again soon.